My name's John, and for the past 15 years, I've been living what I thought was the American dream. Married to Emily, we built a life together in a cozy suburb just outside of Chicago. We had two wonderful kids, Timmy and Ella, ages 12 and 10. Our home was filled with the usual hustle and bustle of family life, soccer games, school projects, and weekend barbecues with friends and family. Emily and I met in college. She was a bright, energetic woman with a contagious laugh and a heart of gold. We fell in love quickly and married right after graduation. I took a job in finance, working my way up the corporate ladder, while Emily became a stay-at-home mom after Timmy was born. Our life seemed perfect. We had a beautiful house, a supportive community, and a family dynamic that many would envy. Our home was a typical two-story house with a white picket fence, a lush green lawn, and a garden that Emily took great pride in. The kids had their rooms decorated just the way they liked, Timmy with his superhero posters and Ella with her ballet trophies. Emily had turned our home into a warm, welcoming place where friends and family loved to gather. Our neighborhood was close-knit, the kind of place where everyone knew each other's names and kids played outside until the streetlights came on. We had a routine that was comforting in its predictability. I commuted to the city for work, while Emily handled the kids' schedules and kept our household running smoothly. Life wasn't without its challenges, but we faced them together, or so I thought. Little did I know, the foundations of my seemingly perfect life were about to be shattered. In the span of a few months, everything I believed in, everything I had worked for, would be called into question. It started subtly. Emily had always been attentive and loving. But recently, there were changes in her behavior that I couldn't quite put my finger on. She began spending more time on her phone, always keeping it close and often turning the screen away when I walked by. She'd laugh at messages but never share what was so funny, which was unusual for her. One evening, as we were getting ready for bed, Emily received a text that made her smile. I casually asked, Who's that? She quickly responded, Oh, just a friend from college. Her explanation seemed reasonable enough, but the way she said it, with a slight hesitation, planted the first seed of doubt in my mind. Our weekends used to be dedicated to family time, but Emily started making excuses to go out alone. She'd say she needed to run errands or meet up with friends she hadn't seen in a while. At first I didn't think much of it, but her absences grew longer and the frequency increased. One Saturday she was gone for nearly the entire day, claiming she had been shopping and lost track of time. When she returned, there were no shopping bags, and she seemed unusually flustered. Emily also began to change her appearance. She started working out more, bought new clothes, and even changed her hairstyle. While it wasn't uncommon for her to take care of herself, these changes seemed more drastic and sudden. When I complimented her on her new look, she shrugged it off, saying she just wanted to feel good about herself. Our intimacy dwindled. Emily often complained about being tired or stressed, and when we did manage to spend time together, she seemed distant, her mind elsewhere. I tried to be understanding, attributing it to the pressures of managing the household and taking care of the kids. However, the more I tried to connect, the more she pulled away. Then there were the phone calls. Emily would step outside or into another room to take certain calls, lowering her voice and ending the conversation abruptly if I walked in. Once, I overheard her laughing and speaking in hushed tones a playful tone I hadn't heard in a while. When she saw me, she quickly ended the call, offering a vague explanation about it being a telemarketer. My suspicions grew, but I didn't want to jump to conclusions. I valued our marriage and didn't want to believe that something was wrong. I tried to push the doubts aside, telling myself that Emily deserved her privacy and that I was probably overthinking things. However, the nagging feeling in the back of my mind wouldn't go away. One night, as I lay in bed unable to sleep, I decided to check her phone. Emily had fallen asleep with it clutched in her hand, so I waited until she turned over and gently took it. My heart pounded as I navigated through her messages. Most of them were mundane, but then I saw a thread with her brother-in-law, David. The messages were friendly, but seemed a bit too familiar, with inside jokes and emojis that made my stomach churn. David had always been close to our family. He was Emily's sister's husband, and we often spent holidays and family gatherings together. He was charming and outgoing, and I had never suspected anything inappropriate between him and Emily. However, the tone of their messages now seemed off, too personal, and too frequent. I put the phone back, feeling a mix of anger and confusion. 
I didn't want to confront Emily without concrete evidence, but I also couldn't ignore what I had seen. The doubts and fears gnawed at me, and I knew I needed to find out the truth, no matter how much it hurt. It was a Wednesday afternoon, and I had left work early because I wasn't feeling well. The headache that had been nagging me all day was a convenient excuse to head home and try to rest. I pulled into the driveway and noticed David's car parked out front. My stomach tightened. What was he doing here on a weekday afternoon? I walked into the house, the front door creaking as I pushed it open. The house was unusually quiet, the kind of quiet that makes your skin crawl. I called out for Emily, but there was no response. My heart pounded in my chest as I made my way through the living room and towards the stairs. As I reached the top of the stairs, I heard muffled voices coming from our bedroom. The door was slightly ajar and I pushed it open. The sight before me made my blood run cold. There on our bed were Emily and David, entangled in a way that left no doubt about what was happening. Are you fucking kidding me? I roared, my voice shaking with fury. They jumped apart, scrambling to cover themselves. Emily's face was a mask of shock and guilt, while David looked like a deer caught in headlights. I could barely see through the red haze of my rage. Without thinking, I lunged at David, grabbing him by the throat and slamming him against the wall. How could you? In my own house! In my own bed! I screamed, my fist connecting with his face. He tried to fend me off, but my anger gave me strength. Punch after punch, I let out all the pain and betrayal I felt. Emily was screaming, trying to pull me off him, but I was unstoppable. John, stop! You're going to kill him! She cried, her voice hysterical. I paused, breathing heavily, my fists still clenched. David's face was a bloody mess, and he was gasping for breath. I let go of him, and he slumped to the floor, groaning. I turned to Emily, who was sobbing uncontrollably, clutching a sheet to her chest. How long? I demanded, my voice cold and hard. How long has this been going on? She shook her head, tears streaming down her face. It was a mistake, John. I'm so sorry. It didn't mean anything. Didn't mean anything? I echoed, my voice rising again. You fucked my brother-in-law in our bed and you say it didn't mean anything? David tried to speak, his words garbled through his swollen lips. John, man, I'm sorry. I... It just happened. Get out! I spat, pointing towards the door. Get the fuck out of my house! David struggled to his feet, staggering out of the bedroom. I turned back to Emily, who was still crying. And you, I said, my voice filled with contempt. How could you do this to me? To us? I didn't mean to hurt you, John. I was lonely, and he was there. It was a mistake. Please, we can work through this, she pleaded, reaching out for me. I stepped back, not wanting her to touch me. A mistake? A mistake is forgetting to pick up the dry cleaning. This... This is a betrayal. You've destroyed everything. The room was filled with the sounds of her sobbing and my heavy breathing. I felt like my world was crashing down around me. The woman I loved, the mother of my children, had shattered the trust we had built over fifteen years. I need you to leave. I said finally, my voice trembling. I can't look at you right now. I need to think. John, please, she begged but I turned away, unable to bear the sight of her. Just go, I repeated, my back to her. I heard her gather her clothes and leave the room, her footsteps echoing down the stairs and out the front door. As the house fell silent, I collapsed onto the bed, the bed where I had just seen my worst nightmare come to life. I buried my face in my hands and let the tears flow, the reality of the betrayal crashing down on me. The hours that followed were a blur, I sat in the living room staring blankly at the walls, replaying the scene over and over in my head. The images of Emily and David, their guilty faces, the betrayal in my own home. It was like a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. That evening, Emily came back. She entered the house cautiously, her eyes swollen and red from crying. I remained on the couch, a cold, unforgiving statue. She stood in the doorway, clutching her purse, her body trembling. John, we need to talk, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. I gestured for her to sit down. She hesitated before perching on the edge of the armchair across from me, as if she might bolt at any moment. Why, Emily? I asked, my voice raw. Why him? Why here? She took a deep breath, her eyes avoiding mine. I don't know how to explain it, she started, her voice quivering. 
It started out innocently. We were just talking, catching up. But then, it turned into something more. I didn't mean for it to happen, John. I swear. Innocently? I scoffed. There's nothing innocent about what I saw today. She flinched, tears streaming down her face again. I know. I know. It was wrong. But you were never around, John. You were always working late. Always preoccupied with your job. I felt so alone. Don't you dare blame this on me! I snapped, my anger flaring up again. I worked hard to provide for this family. And this is how you repay me? By screwing around with David? Emily shook her head, sobbing. I'm not blaming you, John. I'm just trying to make you understand how it happened. I was weak, and I made a horrible mistake. A mistake? I repeated, my voice thick with contempt. This wasn't just a mistake, Emily. This was a choice. A choice you made over and over again. She covered her face with her hands, her body shaking with sobs. I know I don't deserve your forgiveness, but I love you, John. I still love you. Please, we can get through this. We can go to counseling. We can fix this. I stood up, unable to sit still any longer. Fix this? How do you expect me to fix this, Emily? You destroyed our family. You betrayed me in the worst possible way. Emily reached out, desperation in her eyes. Please, John, I'll do anything. Just don't give up on us. I took a step back, shaking my head. I can't even look at you right now. I don't know if I'll ever be able to. For a moment she sat there, defeated. Then she stood up, wiping her tears. I'll stay at my sister's tonight, maybe a few days. Give you some space. Do whatever you want, I said coldly. But understand this. Things will never be the same again. Emily nodded, her shoulders slumped. She walked out of the room, and I listened as the front door closed behind her. The house fell into a suffocating silence, the weight of the day pressing down on me. I spent the next few hours pacing the house, my mind racing. How could she have done this? How long had it been going on? And what about the kids? How would they handle this? Late into the night, I finally collapsed into bed, exhaustion overtaking my rage. But sleep didn't bring peace. Only more questions and the painful reality that my marriage, my life, had been shattered by the person I trusted the most. The next morning, I woke up to an empty house. Emily hadn't returned, and I was grateful for the solitude. I needed time to think, to process everything that had happened. I called in sick to work, unable to face the world just yet. I spent the day in a daze, replaying every interaction with Emily and David, looking for signs I might have missed. By evening the anger had started to subside, replaced by a deep, aching sadness. I knew I needed to talk to someone, to get some perspective. I picked up the phone and called my best friend Mike. Hey man, I need to talk, I said, my voice cracking. John, what's going on? Mike asked, concern evident in his voice. I took a deep breath and told him everything. The affair, the confrontation, the betrayal. Mike listened without interrupting letting me pour out all the pain and confusion I'd been holding inside. Jesus, John, he said finally. I don't even know what to say. That's... that's messed up. Yeah, I agreed, feeling a small sense of relief at sharing my burden. I don't know what to do, Mike. I feel like my whole life is falling apart. Listen, he said, his voice firm. You need to take care of yourself. Take some time to figure out what you want. And don't let Emily push you into anything. You deserve better than this. Thanks, man, I said, grateful for his support. I don't know what I'd do without you. We'll get through this, John, Mike said, one step at a time. After hanging up, I felt a little stronger, a little more resolved. I didn't have all the answers, but I knew I couldn't let Emily's betrayal define me. I had to think about my kids, about their future. And I had to start thinking about my own healing, one step at a time. The days that followed were a mix of numbness and anger. Emily stayed at her sister's house, and I took care of the kids, trying to maintain some semblance of normalcy for their sake. Timmy and Ella could sense the tension, but I did my best to shield them from the full extent of the situation. Meanwhile, I couldn't shake the image of Emily and David together. It played on a loop in my mind, fueling my rage. I found myself obsessing over their betrayal, unable to focus on anything else. I needed an outlet for my anger a way to reclaim some control over my shattered life. One evening after putting the kids to bed, I sat in the living room nursing a bottle of whiskey. 
The more I drank, the more my thoughts darkened. I couldn't just let them get away with it. They needed to feel the pain they had caused me. I picked up my phone and scrolled through my contacts until I found David's number. My fingers trembled as I typed out a message. Meet me at the park tomorrow at 5 p.m. We need to talk. The next day, I left work early and drove to the park, my heart pounding in my chest. I waited by the picnic tables, my anger simmering just below the surface. When David arrived, he looked nervous, glancing around as if expecting an ambush. John, he said cautiously, what do you want? I stepped closer, my fists clenched at my sides. I want you to understand what you've done. You've destroyed my family, David. How could you do that to me? He tried to speak, but I cut him off, the words spilling out in a torrent of rage. You came into my home, slept with my wife, and you think you can just walk away? You think you can just apologize and make it all better? David held up his hands, trying to placate me. John, I'm sorry, I really am. It was a mistake. A mistake? I scoffed. That's what you both keep saying. But it wasn't a mistake, David. It was a choice. And now you're going to face the consequences. Before he could react, I swung my fist, landing a punch squarely on his jaw. He stumbled back, but I didn't give him a chance to recover. I tackled him to the ground, my fists pummeling his face, my anger giving me strength. John, stop, he pleaded, blood streaming from his nose. Please. But I couldn't stop. The weeks of betrayal and heartache had built up to this moment, and I needed to release it all. It was only when I heard a voice behind me that I paused. John, enough! Mike shouted, grabbing my arm and pulling me off David. You're going to kill him! I looked down at David, who was barely conscious, his face a bloody mess. Mike held me back, his grip firm. This isn't the way, John. You need to think about your kids. The mention of Timmy and Ella snapped me out of my rage. I took a step back, my chest heaving, my knuckles bruised and bloody. David lay on the ground, groaning in pain. Mike guided me away from the scene, his voice calm and steady. Let's get out of here. We'll figure this out another way. As we walked back to the car, the reality of what I had done began to sink in. I had let my anger take over, and now I was left with the consequences. But part of me didn't regret it. David deserved to feel some of the pain he had caused me. That night, as I sat in the quiet of my living room, I realized that revenge hadn't brought me the satisfaction I had hoped for. It had only added to the chaos and turmoil of my life. I needed to find a way to move forward, for my sake and for my kids. Emily called the next day, her voice hesitant. John, I heard about what happened with David. Are you okay? I'm fine, I replied curtly. But this doesn't change anything, Emily. We're still done. She sighed, a mixture of relief and sadness. I understand, but please, for the kids' sake, let's try to keep things civil. I'll do my best, I said, my voice hard. But don't expect me to forgive you. Not now, not ever. After hanging up, I took a deep breath and looked around the house. It was time to start picking up the pieces, to rebuild my life from the wreckage, and I knew that the first step was to let go of the anger and focus on what mattered most, my children and their future. The weeks that followed were a blur of legal consultations, paperwork, and tense phone calls. Emily and I barely spoke, communicating only when absolutely necessary and primarily about the kids. I filed for divorce and the process began, a grueling path that would take months to finalize. One evening, Emily called and asked if we could meet to talk. Reluctantly, I agreed, hoping to settle some matters without the need for more conflict. We decided to meet at a nearby cafe a neutral ground where we could have a civil conversation. As I walked into the cafe, I saw Emily sitting at a table in the corner, nervously stirring a cup of coffee. I took a deep breath and approached, sitting down across from her. Thank you for meeting with me, she said softly, avoiding my gaze. Let's get this over with, I replied, my tone flat. She looked up, her eyes filled with remorse. John, I know you don't want to hear this, but I'm sorry. I truly am. I never meant to hurt you. I clenched my fists under the table, trying to keep my emotions in check. Sorry doesn't change what happened, Emily. You destroyed our family. Tears welled up in her eyes, but she continued. I know. And I take full responsibility for my actions. But we need to find a way to move forward, especially for Timmy and Ella. I nodded, 
my anger simmering just below the surface. I'm only here to discuss the kids. They need stability, and they need both of us in their lives. She wiped away a tear and nodded. I agree. I've been staying with my sister, but I want to be involved in their lives as much as possible. I want us to co-parent effectively. Co-parenting means putting the kids first, I said firmly. No more lies, no more secrets. They need to know they can trust us. Emily looked down, her voice barely above a whisper. I know, and I'll do whatever it takes to earn back their trust. We spent the next hour discussing logistics, how we would share custody, how we would handle holidays, school events, and medical decisions. It was painful, but necessary. We agreed on a schedule that would allow the kids to spend time with both of us, trying to minimize the disruption to their lives. As we wrapped up the conversation, Emily reached across the table, her hand hovering near mine. John, I know it's too late to ask for your forgiveness, but I hope one day you'll find it in your heart to forgive me. Not for my sake, but for the sake of our children. I pulled my hand away, shaking my head. I'm not there yet, Emily. I don't know if I ever will be. But for the kids, I'll try to keep things civil. She nodded, her expression resigned. That's all I can ask. We stood up, and I walked out of the cafe, feeling a mix of relief and sorrow. The conversation had been necessary, but it hadn't healed the wounds. It would take time, maybe years, for the pain to fade. Back home, I sat down with Timmy and Ella, explaining the new arrangements. They listened quietly, their faces serious. When I finished, Timmy spoke up. Dad, is it going to be okay? I pulled him into a hug, feeling Ella's small arms wrap around me as well. Yes, buddy, it's going to be okay. It'll be different, but we'll get through this together. The following months were challenging as we navigated the complexities of our new lives. Emily and I stuck to our agreement, maintaining a fragile truce for the sake of the kids. The divorce was finalized, and we each began to rebuild our lives separately. Throughout it all, I focused on being there for Timmy and Ella, providing them with the love and support they needed. Slowly, the anger and resentment began to fade, replaced by a determination to create a better future for myself and my children. Emily and I would never be the same, but we had found a way to coexist, united by our love for Timmy and Ella. It wasn't the ending I had envisioned, but it was a new beginning, a chance to start over and find happiness again one step at a time. Life after the divorce was a constant balancing act. My main priority was making sure Timmy and Ella felt as stable and loved as possible, despite the upheaval. I threw myself into my role as a father, determined to give them the security and consistency they needed. My work became a refuge of sorts. I started taking on more projects, diving into tasks that kept my mind occupied and my days busy. The routine of the office, the familiar faces of colleagues, and the clear-cut goals of each workday provided a structure that helped me rebuild my sense of self. But the nights were the hardest. When the kids were asleep and the house was quiet, the memories of the betrayal would creep back in. I would sit in the living room, staring at the family photos on the walls, and wonder how things had gone so wrong. The loneliness was palpable, a heavy presence that seemed to fill every corner of the house. Despite the sadness, there were moments of clarity and growth. I started running again, something I hadn't done in years. The physical exertion was cathartic, helping to clear my mind and release pent-up emotions. I also began reading more, losing myself in books that offered both escape and insight. Timmy and Ella adjusted to the new normal better than I had expected. They split their time between my house and Emily's, and we made sure to keep their routines as consistent as possible. We attended their soccer games and school events together, putting on a united front for their sake. It wasn't always easy but it was necessary. One evening, as we were sitting at the dinner table, Timmy looked up at me with a serious expression. Dad, are you happy? The question caught me off guard. I looked at him, and then at Ella, who was watching me intently. I took a deep breath and smiled. I'm getting there, buddy. It's a process, but every day is a little better. Ella reached across the table and took my hand. We love you, Dad. I love you too, both of you, I said, feeling a warmth spread through me. And that's what matters most. The days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months. Slowly but surely, 
the wounds began to heal. Emily and I maintained a civil relationship, communicating openly about the kids and working together to ensure their well-being. There were still moments of tension, but they were fewer and further between. I found solace in small things. The sound of Timmy and Ella's laughter, the satisfaction of completing a project at work, the peacefulness of an early morning run. These moments reminded me that life goes on and that happiness can be found in unexpected places. One afternoon, as I was cleaning out the garage, I came across an old box of photographs. I sat down and began sorting through them, memories of happier times flooding back. There were pictures of our wedding, family vacations, and countless birthdays and holidays. It was bittersweet, but it also reminded me of the good times we had shared. I decided to keep a few of the photos, not out of nostalgia for what was lost, but as a reminder of what had been good. The rest I packed away, ready to move forward without the weight of the past holding me back. As time passed, I began to rediscover who I was outside of my roles as a husband and father. I reconnected with old friends, pursued new interests, and started setting goals for the future. I wasn't sure where the path would lead, but I was determined to walk it with an open heart and a resilient spirit. One evening, Timmy, Ella, and I sat in the backyard, roasting marshmallows over a small fire pit. The sky was clear, and the stars were just starting to appear. Ella snuggled up next to me, her head resting on my shoulder. Dad, she said softly, I'm glad we're all together. I know things have been hard, but I think we're going to be okay. I kissed the top of her head and smiled. I think so too, Ella, I think so too. In the end, the betrayal had forced me to confront some harsh realities, but it had also given me the chance to rebuild my life in a way that was true to who I was. It had taught me the importance of resilience, the value of family, and the strength that comes from facing adversity head on. As I sat there with my children, the warmth of the fire and their love surrounding me, I knew that I was on the right path. The road ahead might still be uncertain, but for the first time in a long time, I felt hopeful about the future. And that was enough.